Florence and uh, into Rome and try to discuss and find some kind of reconciliation on which the points of the uh, tradition of the Catholic Church, with, particularly with respect to the delicate problem of the filioque argument, the nature of the Son with respect to the Father and the Spirit and all of that. Uh, they couldn't agree on that. But now the curious, the interesting thing here is that the, when Greek, the language of Greek, had fallen out amongst the Western tradition for centuries. Nobody knew it. Nobody knew how to speak it. No, nobody knew what it was. They had read about it. Latin was the primary language. The only people who knew Greek were the Irish, the Celtic Irish Christians who survived during this period. Uh, Thomas Cale wrote a whole book on it, How the Irish Saved Civilization. It's a very entertaining book uh, that describes how these Irish monks lived in these enclaves up in the north, entirely cut off from a world that was flooded with barbarians. And they learned Greek, and they kept the language going. Uh, but it never really, even though the Irish, they were destroyed by the Vikings. And if the Vikings hadn't come in and wiped out the monasteries of Lindisfarne and Iona and so forth, there might have been a totally unique uh, version, a mystical version of Christianity that was cons that was uh, could interface more easily with this Hermetic tradition. But the these people were wiped out by the Are you Vikings. Talking about ancient Greek as opposed to what what had then become modern Greek. Ancient Greek. Uh, the, yes, exactly. So uh, these men, Scotus Oregano was one of them, and they sort of um, escaped from the Vikings. There were just a couple of them, and they went in, and they basically were uh, brought into the university system, but the learning of Greek was lost. So, so was the, were the, the, at that time, modern Greeks unaware of what ancient Greek was all about at that time? No, I think the modern Greeks still had, were still carrying the tradition. Okay, so, so that's why the Westerners. As we, if we flip over geographically to the Eastern Mediterranean, the Byzantine world, these men still had contact and were keeping those texts. Okay. okay, so what happens is then during the 15th century, these Greek monks begin coming over into Italy and they're bringing the texts of Plato and the Corpus Hermeticum with them. But during the Middle Ages, uh, nobody knew much about Plato. There was only one or two of his texts that survived uh, the so-called Dark Ages. And so here was uh, the court that had been, that was run at this time by Cosimo de' Medici and the great de' Medici family and the new um, elite, uh, the artists that were coming in, Botticelli was there and Michelangelo and all of these people. And in comes these Greek scholars with the text of Plotinus, who was um, the founder of Neoplatonism, Plato, all the writings of Plato, and uh, the Corpus Hermeticum. And this was a new treasure chest. I mean, these people went crazy over this stuff. And so Marsilio Ficino uh, was hired by Cosimo de' Medici to translate these writings. And it was thought that these writings, and in particular the Corpus Hermeticum, rather than Plato, uh, was thought to be the oldest tradition in the world at this time. It was thought to go back to the Egyptians. And of course, in a sense, it did because the Corpus Hermeticum had originated in Alexandria, but it was the Hellenistic Greek Alexandria, not the ancient Egypt of the pharaohs, as everyone wanted to believe at this time. So there was a kind of aura of antiquity about these texts, the Corpus Hermeticum, and so it was very urgent that they be translated. So they were translated by Marcello Ficino, and then he proceeded to translate the writings of Plato and Plotinus, and uh, he and uh, the other scholar, whose name uh, escapes me at the moment, the Kabbalist, began learning this stuff, and a new academy was set up, a new uh, which was regarded as the reopening of Plato's Academy, which had been shut down by under Emperor Justinian in the sixth century. And uh, so this academy was opened up and everybody started learning this, including the artists. This is one of the last periods where, and this is why we love the Renaissance so much, where the artists can still speak the language of scholarship and vice versa. So the artists are not a bunch of dummies who are just you know, intuitively painting. They're learned, intelligent, and every bit as scholastic as the uh, scholars who are translating these texts. And so when they go back to their canvases, they take this knowledge with them, Botticelli in particular, and they start painting, and you get a whole, you get first the introduction of paganism itself, starting with the birth of Venus and the Primavera by Botticelli. But then you find that with the upthrust of paganism, what they really thought they were doing was showing the equivalencies between the pagan tradition and what the Greeks were up to, and basically it was the same thing as what the Christian tradition read in terms of this tradition could equal. So they thought they were performing this kind of eclectic synthesis. They didn't see any contradictions here at all. If these texts were read in terms of Neoplatonism, you could harmonize them. 
So you get each one of the, the paintings uh, that we're talking about here, and this includes Michelangelo as, as well, uh, and most of these painters, are kind of uh, hermetic script that you can't make sense out of. You can look at them and say they're beautiful colors, but there's a whole esoteric tradition embedded in there, and the Primavera is a classic example. Uh, it's a visual illustration of the philosophy of Plato and uh, Corpus Hermeticum, the hermetic tradition generally. And so that was the last time. Leonardo, for some reason, uh, kept his distance from the hermetic tradition. He knew about it and respected it, but he was more interested in geometry, and so there are more, uh, you find in his paintings, mathematical allegories. He's not so much interested in the hermetic tradition, so you don't see as much of it as you do in Michelangelo. Now that was the second phase of the recovery of this hermetic tradition. The third and major phase is at the end of the 19th century, the so-called theosophical movement begins. And that movement was made possible by the, the British conquest of India in the 18th century. The British go into India, they conquer it, and they begin to tr translate the Indian texts. And the first text translated uh, was, I believe, uh, Shakuntala's, uh, uh, or Kalidasa's uh, Shakuntala, uh, which was a play, and then the Bhagavad Gita. These texts were translated. Goethe was an early admirer of the Eastern tradition based on these texts. He didn't like Hindu art at all. He repelled him. But um, from that point on, these texts began, the Hindu writings began to be translated into Western languages. And from that point on, in the 19th century, there was a new eclectic spirit that comes in. Schopenhauer was the first Western philosopher and the academic mainstream to pick up the ideas of the Hindus, recognize their equivalence with certain aspects of Plato and Kant, who was his mentor, fuse them together, and you get this whole wonderful new thrust in the academic tradition. Nietzsche picks it up in The Birth of Tragedy. Wagner uh, was tuning into it. He was a big disciple of Schopenhauer. And, uh, but in many cases, they are mistranslating or translating into what they think the Hindus are saying. So they're missing a lot of the, the dimensions. But more and more text came into being as the 19th century and its scholarship uh, improved. And the theosophists come in, and there's a whole new spiritual movement uh, based on this interface with the hermetic tradition insofar as it uh, interfaces with the, the Hindu branch of it. Now out of this, this whole matrix, uh, Carl Jung really comes. He steps onto the stage here. Um, he didn't care much for theosophy. Uh, he regarded it as, as uh, um, a betrayal of the Western tradition. We should not, uh, as we'll see in the next talk on Jung's attitude toward the East, we should not practice uh, yoga. We should not go to the East. We will not find the answers to Western problems by uh, importing Eastern ideas. We must stick with our own traditions. And so that's why alchemy interested Jung so much. He really wanted to find a system, a Western esoteric system that would basically objectify or give an equivalent of the individuation process as he had uh, put it together. And he had been studying Gnosticism for a while, but the Gnostics seemed too remote. The Gnostics uh, were about contemporary with the alchemists and the early Christians. They seemed too remote for him. And uh, when he started recovering and reading and studying the alchemical texts, he realized that the and it was primarily the 17th century alchemists, the climax of alchemy that interested him, he began to see certain parallels between what the alchemists were up to and the whole individuation process. And he began to realize that this was the answer to sort of objectifying his system as something that was rooted in the Western tradition and was not just a personal neurotic creation, as uh, many of the Freudians had accused Jung of being a narcissist and uh, simply uh, spinning off these ideas off the top of his head. But here he found this objective Western grounding uh, for his system of ideas. So he spends the rest of his life uh, immersed in these alchemical texts. He said um, in late, uh, it was in 1928 or 29 that uh, he had a dream. And he said that it was uh, a premonition that he would, he knew nothing about alchemy at the time, but he had this dream that he entered into a room, a new wing had been added onto his house, and it was filled with shelves and shelves full of ancient manuscripts. And as he was going through them, he realized that they were manuscripts from the 17th century. And he could never figure out what the dream was until he started studying alchemy, and he began to realize that most of the alchemical texts that would interest him would be from the 17th century. So he saw that as a premonition of this next phase of his, uh, of his uh, intellectual career. So alchemy becomes his primary obsession now from, from 
1929, 1930 on down till his death in 61. Yeah. So from the Freudian point of view, he did uh, spin it off the top of his head, and then he went to alchemy to to, to look for the, the antecedents to it. Exactly. Uh, I, mean, I mean, from a Freudian point of view, 